Good afternoon, and welcome to our medical leadership huddle. I'm Tony Burchard, president of the Virginia Hospital Center Foundation. And it's great to be back to share the latest information about the hospital's ongoing response to COVID-19. So to ensure best viewing quality, I'm asking all participants um, to stay muted and not use your video. But feel free to send your questions directly to the Zoom chat box, or if you've called in, you can email them to foundation at Virginia, virginiahospitalcenter.com. So we'll answer your questions after the presentation. So to kick things off, I'd like to introduce uh, you to today's guest speaker, Dr. Rohit Modak. He's the chairman of our infectious disease team and he's participated in multiple medical leadership huddles. So Dr. Modak, I'd like to get started by asking you to update um, our uh, participants this afternoon as how things are going here in Arlington and Northern Virginia in general, at how it relates to our um, peak time back in the spring and summer, where things stand today, and where do you think see things going between now and say the end of the calendar year? Okay. Well, thank you, Tony. Uh, first of all, can you hear me okay? Just a little bit louder. A little bit louder. So I'll tell you what, I'll move the computer closer to me and I'll speak louder. Hopefully between these two things, it'll work well. Fantastic. Um, you've asked me to tackle a lot and that's I did because I've been, I've been tackling a lot as everyone has here at Virginia Hospital Center for the whole summer. And we've had numerous meetings, numerous discussions about how to keep ourselves safe, how to keep our patients healthy, how to help our community. So let me kind of start at the beginning, give an overview of where we've been and where we're going. And um, of course, ha I may miss some things and I'm happy to answer questions as we go along or at the end. So it's now, where are we? We're at the end of October and it was really the end of January that this started picking up, that we started hearing more and more about it. So we're nine months removed from when this started. And I actually remember I was uh, visiting um, relatives in India over last Christmas break. And I remember getting on my plane on January 2nd or 3rd, I got an update on my phone from my infectious disease organization saying, hey, there's something happening in Wuhan. There's this new pneumonia happening and we're kind of worried about it. And that was my first thought that, hey, this, this may come to the US. So really we are 10 plus months, you know, when we kind of had a warning about this. So it, we had our first meetings in January in the hospital about this, and the meetings kicked up in February. And by middle of March, we started seeing our first few patients. Probably by early March, we started seeing uh, the first few patients. And the numbers just kicked up. And this happened across the country, particularly in Seattle, in New York, of course, really in the Northeast, and in the DC area. So by the end of March, we were seeing lots of cases really that April was April and May, March through May was our hot spot here. That's when our percent positivity rate was over 50% or basically our hospital was a COVID hospital. As everyone remembers, things were not business as usual. We shut down surgeries. We didn't know exactly where, what was going to happen. We didn't know how many people would get it, how many people would die, how this would, if it would be contained, if we would get medicines. It was tremendous pressure for everyone and it, it was a horrible time. It was horrible because we didn't know what would happen. And I've spoken about this before, perhaps on calls like this, where usually in medicine and in my field particularly, but in a lot of fields, yes, it's hard. And yes, sometimes things don't go as, as we hope they will, but we know what we're dealing with. And we have an ability to take care of people. And the problem with COVID was we didn't know what was happening and we didn't have medicine. And we saw people coming in and getting sicker and sicker and not being able to do much. And of course we did our best. And I know that we had better outcomes than a lot of other places, but it was challenging, right? We wanna see outcomes that are great for everybody. And we were scared as healthcare professionals, our patients were scared. We were scared for our patients, scared for each other. Remember in April in New York, there was a lot of people getting sick, uh, healthcare workers getting sick. We didn't have PPE, we didn't know what was happening. So at VHC, I mean, again, I go back and thank our administration. I thank Charles Fletcher, um, who was able to get PPE. That's one thing we didn't do without. We were rationing, we still are rationing because we don't know what the future holds, but we had PPE. Looking back, we were able to protect ourselves. We are able to protect ourselves. We are able to protect our patients. 
speaking just numbers wise, what happened? So we kind of hit our peak, I would say by um, the end of, of April, early May, we had over 100 patients in the hospital with coronavirus. And from there, it seemed to go down. So by about end of May, we were coming down to about 80 patients. By mid-June, we were in the range of about 30 patients. By the end of June, we were around 15 patients in the hospital. And we were feeling much better about things. So also at, by this time, by April, May, we had remdesivir. We were participating in the clinical trial. So that was the one therapeutic shown to be helpful. In retrospect, it probably isn't that helpful. I can talk more about that later, but we had it. Um, we were using convalescent plasma, which we were getting from the Mayo Clinic through a, a, a partnership with them. So that was very exciting. We had something to offer patients and the numbers were going down. And in the summer, I'd say the numbers stayed down. So we had about 15 to 20 patients in the hospital, give or take, but in that range, basically from the end of June up until last week. That's how it was. Now, there was a second peak in the summer, which we saw in the Sunbelt states. So in Arizona, in uh, Texas and Florida, and that scared us. It said, what's gonna happen? And certainly throughout the country, we saw after every holiday, Memorial Day, July 4th, Labor Day, there's been rises because people get together. And as much as you say, you know, don't get together, always wear a mask, stay outdoors, People do it somewhat, but not really. And we see rises directly after that, a couple of weeks later. But we didn't have that in Virginia, and particularly in Arlington. And why was that? Well, I think, number one, we learned our lesson in April when things were terrible. I mean, those memories are still with us. Um, we had a slow opening. So, you know, our governor didn't say, okay, everyone just go out, go back to work, and don't worry about it. It was very, um, very deliberate that it was, okay, stage one, certain things are open, wear a mask, go out if you have to, please try to telework if you can. And then we went to the stage two and three where they opened up a little more and a little more. And if you look around Arlington, I think we're still doing a pretty good job. People are generally wearing masks. Occasionally you'll see people not, but indoors, yes, absolutely they are. Um, and I think it's a great thing that we're seeing around. And I think Arlington has been better than most of Virginia. So even now, when we look at things, well, Let's kind of look at first the country and then our local area. So the country is seeing peaks like we've never seen before. I think the last two days this weekend, we had 80,000 new cases in the United States, both Saturday and Sunday, and both are record highs. So higher than ever before. And where are we seeing it? Well, we're seeing it more in the Midwest. So states that haven't had as much before, we're seeing it in Indiana and Michigan and Wisconsin. Um, and I think a couple of things are happening. Number one, People are tired, pandemic fatigue, right? We're all tired of this. We wanna see our families. We wanna be able to just go out and maybe not wear a mask or at least, fine, I'll wear a mask, but can I see my friends again? Can I see my family? So people are getting tired of it and they're not being as strict. It's colder now, particularly in the upper Midwest. People are meeting inside. They, they don't want to uh, necessarily bundle up and meet outside. I mean, I'm sure we saw there's snow in Denver. It was, it's crazy, right? The winter is here, it's, but people, therefore moving inside. So cases are going up. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the rhetoric hasn't changed. And I know we're not political here and nor do we want to be, but we are science-based, right? So Sorry. this idea that masks doesn't work, that's silly. Of course, masks work, but there's a percentage of the population of the United States that doesn't necessarily buy into that. So people aren't wearing masks and people are getting infected. So the numbers are going up. And I expect that to happen in Virginia. I expect that to happen everywhere. So what's happening in our local area? Well, actually we've been in Arlington, been pretty consistent. So our percent positivity rate in the state of Virginia is about 6%. And that's where it has been between five and 6% over the last few months. In, Virginia, in Arlington, in our hospital specifically, because we measure the, the tests we do here, our percent positivity rate is between three and 4%. So it varies, you know, some days it's under three, sometimes it's over four. I think our last reading was just over 4%, but we're in that range. So we haven't seen much of a move and I commend our community, our local Northern Virginia community for doing that. But I'm sure everyone on the call knows, you know, I've this summer, you're in Arlington, you're in Fairfax, things seem pretty good. As I took a couple of trips to the Shenandoah uh, National Park, even as you drive out to Leesburg and Luray and these towns, I see lots of people just 
hanging out with no masks at a gas station, at a restaurant. It's, you know, the, the mandate of masks hasn't reached them yet. They don't feel that pressure. And I think that's why the rest of Virginia is a lot higher than our community is. And it worries me because there's no barrier between us and them. We're all one community. We're one, one community, one state, one country. We are traveling. Thanksgiving is coming up. There will be movement. And it puts all of us at risk. And it worries me. So we've done very well. We're not where we were at April, in April. Today in the hospital, we have about 35 patients. This is the most we've had since the middle of June. So the most in four months. Is this just a blip? You know, last week it was a lot lower. Maybe it'll go right back down. That would be wonderful. But I'll tell you, Tony, and to everyone on the call, it, it worries me. It worries me where we're going because I see what's happening in the rest of the country. And I know holidays are coming up and it's Thanksgiving and it's just a scary time. And I worry that things are getting worse. So Dr. Bodak, thank, thank you very much for walking us through that. Because the one thing you didn't mention, you mentioned a lot of variables and I, I hate to be the apostle of the obvious, but we, are, we have entered into the cold and flu season as well. And I know that here at Virginia Hospital Center, we've been very diligent in telling our patients, our employees, our other stakeholders, go get a flu shot. It's probably one of the most important things you can do to avoid that, uh, that particular infectious disease. But um, what, what are you reading and what, what are the experts saying around this potential double whammy of uh, you know, flu season compounding uh, COVID? Okay, great, so that's a good question, Tony. So let's kind of back up, just talk about the flu for a second. Why, why is flu so bad? Is it suddenly that the virus mutates and there's every September, October, there's this horrible strain that comes out and we're not used to it? The answer is no. Actually, there's flu year round. We don't think about it, but there is. People get the flu in the summer. It's just that now as it gets cold, everyone runs inside and we're sh sharing each other's spaces and we're talking to each other and we're touching handles and the flu is spread this way. So like everything in infectious disease, hands, 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 wash your hands, everybody, but in close spaces. We're now wearing masks and hopefully we're still doing that. Yep. So that should help slow down the uh, spread of the flu. But the worry of course, is just like the flu, COVID is gonna spread as we get indoors. So it's not just someone coughing on you. We know it's people who talk, talk a lot, right? And is it just talking? Well, some people, I'm sure we all have people in our lives who when they talk, man, they talk. And they really talk. So yes, it's talking, it's singing, it's laughing, it's anything that can produce these droplets that come out. And we know a lot more than we did six months ago. It's not just droplets. Yes, it is airborne. What does that mean? Does that mean that if I'm talking in a room, it's going to go through the vents and affect someone down the hall? Probably not like that. But at the same time, it's not just six feet. If you're seven feet away, it doesn't mean you're safe that it can still linger in a room, especially an in indoor room where there's not a lot of wind blowing through. So that's why you have to wear a mask, even if you're more than six feet away. It, it just makes sense. So I'm absolutely concerned about this cold weather and the double whammy. What we talk about is if it is a bad flu season, if people are getting sick, now your immune system's low and now you're dealing with the flu and COVID potentially, the mortality, meaning people are gonna get a lot sicker, a lot more in the hospital, a lot more people are going to die. And we were scared back in March and April that our hospital would be overwhelmed. And it certainly, you know, New York City, all those hospitals are overwhelmed. Right now, Wisconsin, all the hospitals are overwhelmed. They don't have enough beds. We never got to that point, you know, and, and thankfully we didn't. Our, we had enough, we had the ability to take care of our community. But what's going to happen now? Numbers are creeping up. They're not like they were. We have a lot of room. We're still safe. You know, this is a great place. This is where I would want to be. But what if it's a tremendous flu season? What if it's a tremendous COVID season? You know, scientists have said it's going to be a dark winter. And it certainly can be. And we can overwhelm ourselves. And that's why it's not a time for complacency. It's not a time to think that, oh, things are great now. We've learned so much. In fact, the more we learn, the more we know we don't know about it. I don't have a lot more treatments to offer. I don't have a magic bullet. I'm... Would you mind if I talk a little about treatments, Tony? No, I was going to say, I was just, as perfect, I was going to say, let's talk, uh, God forbid, somebody does get diagnosed, um, please kind of walk us through what we've learned is, and what 
what has happened uh, around treatments, and then sure. you can, if you could go right into Operation Warp Speed and some of the outcomes associated with that. I know I was on a call last week where they gave a briefing, and uh, not not being a medical doctor, much rather have you explain it. Okay, so the treatment for most viral illnesses is supportive care. So what does that mean? It's exactly what you think it means. It's stay home, drink some chicken soup, let mom put a blanket over you, take some Tylenol if you need it. There's really not much we have to offer. Viruses have to run their course. Yeah. We have some antivirals for certain things, but really that's not the mainstay of treatment. And for coronavirus, I'd argue it's exactly the same thing. So we're looking for this magic bullet. You know, was it remdesivir? Was it convalescent plasma? And all these things we offered here. So the idea behind these things are these will help stop the virus from replicating. But our view of this disease is a little bit different now than it was six months ago. So now I think of coronavirus or COVID-19 as almost two separate stages. There's the viral replicative phase. So that's when you get the virus and the virus is moving and it's kicking and, and replicating and going more and more and more. And in this stage, this is when an antiviral may help. So it's early on in illness in the first couple of days before people are super sick, just while it's replicating. So that's when the use of remdesivir is helpful. And in our hospital, we're really limiting the use of remdesivir to people who've been here for only three days. And really the data supports that, that's people who get sick often. So if you're homesick for a week, which many people are before they even need to be in the hospital, chances are remdesivir is not gonna be that helpful. I mean, we give it because it's something we can do, but it's not gonna change much. Convalescent plasma is the same idea. It's an antibody, right? The idea is that someone has antibodies against this virus. And let's kind of also in the same category, talk about monoclonal antibodies. So what the president got, this Regeneron compound um, or a polyclonal antibody, the idea is kind of the same. It's that we're giving a patient an antibody. So that really only helps before someone develops their own antibodies. Now that usually happens seven to 10 days after exposure. So again, early on, that's when these things can make a difference. After the viral replicated, replicative phase, the next phase is this, think of it like the immune system is out of control. It's this immune phase, it's that your body is trying to fight it. So people get high fevers and they end up on the ventilator and they get blood clots. So we know coronavirus is a systemic disease. People can get strokes and they have neurologic problems and you name it, they can have problems. And it's almost like your body turns on the on switch trying to fight it and it can't shut it off. And now people get sicker and sicker and sicker. And here, you know, we, we have a few things that help, maybe steroids, we know steroids help. We try to get steroids early and continue it. And that's about it. You know, we do, we're studying a lot of things. There's a lot of data about different things, but a lot of these are IV and a lot of patients may be sick at home. And how do we get these patients their medicine? So it's really hard to say. And like everything in my field in infectious disease, the best treatment is prevention, right? It's much better if we don't get it. So this whole concept of, oh, we should do herd immunity. Everyone should get it. Absolutely not. Because guess what? Everyone's going to get sick and a lot of people are going to die if that happens. So how do you prevent the infection? So let's talk about Operation Warp Speed. That's the vaccine. That's a very, you know, vaccines are wonderful. They've revolutionized the world, right? Of course, my cardiologist will disagree and they'll think, oh, the most important thing is a beta blocker, is my aspirin, is the, you know, the advances in heart disease and heart attack. No way, it's vaccines. Vaccines have changed this world. That's what's done it. So do we have a vaccine? Well, they're working on it, right? Operation Warp Speed. And initially we had said, oh, vaccine is two to three years away, but every scientist in the world is working on a vaccine. So we should get it sooner. And that's wonderful. When will it come? It's looking now like it will be, hopefully something will be out by the end of the year. But what does out mean? It doesn't mean FDA approved, but it means emergency use. So we don't have the strong data but it looks good enough that maybe we'll get something by the end of the year. Then what? Well, there's a big difference between having approval and then actually getting it to people. So of course, the first step we say are healthcare workers and the elderly. Let's first talk about healthcare workers. So we've had meetings here. Even our public health department is saying, look, they're expecting once the government has a vaccine to go through the public health department to get to the hospital. How, who are we going to give it to? Well, we'll give it to our healthcare workers. Does every healthcare worker want it? Um, okay, if they do want it, who's first in line? We, we, we're making those lists now. You know, who can get it? And then what? Well, is it two shots? Is it one shot? And likely it'll be a two shot series. We need to store it at a negative 30 degree temperature. So we're working on those logistics. 
probably by early 2021. So January into February, we should have enough if things go well and it looks like they are. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to always second guess what the government's doing, right? But yeah, let's have some faith that by January, February, we'll have enough for healthcare workers. And then as we roll it out to the general public, which means into the spring and summer by the time everyone gets it. The big problem with the vaccine, is it gonna be like the measles vaccine, which is 99% effective and you give it and you're done and everyone's happy? Or is it gonna be like the flu shot, which is great, it prevents people from dying, but it may be 60% effective, which is good enough. It may help, but you have to get it every year. It's seasonal, things change. These are things we don't know yet. And that's why the vaccine is not the end all be all, even once we give it. Plus what's gonna happen six months down the road? We don't have six month data on vaccines because it's, they're just coming out now. We're gonna learn a lot as we go along, which is unfortunate we have to do it that way, but oh, okay, that's the situation we're in. So when it comes down to what can you do? Well, guess what? I haven't gotten coronavirus. No one in my hospital has. Now, of course, yes, people in the hospital have, but no one at work has. Why? Because we mask, because we social distance, because we make it our policy and we stick to it and we're very strict. And if we have someone who's sick, we tell them don't come to work. If someone is positive, we find out who their contacts are. If there are other employees, we keep those employees home. We're very deliberate in how we handle this. And we don't have infection from employee to employee within the hospital. And it works. Dr. Modak, that's very helpful. In fact, that we've got some questions already coming in. Okay. And the first question, this kind of leads right into it. It's about testing. And uh, somebody sent a note in and said um, they, they received an email from Costco and that Costco is now offering in-home collection kits and that you can even go to watch a how-to video to make sure that you do the collection properly. You pack up the sample and you return it overnight. And within 48 hours, you've, you've got uh, the results back. Um, are you familiar with this um, in-home collection concept? Um, and would, I am. You recommend, would you recommend people doing this? So, so let's, let's talk about this. There's different testing for coronavirus. Now, the better testing is a PCR test, which means they look for the DNA of the virus itself. Yep. There's ways to do it. There's a nasopharyngeal swab, which is if anyone's been to VAT, that's what we do here. Yes. There's an oropharyngeal swab, which is your throat. Now, in the last few weeks, they've come out with a nasal swab, which is just you, you know, just in your nose. It's not deep. There's also a saliva test, which is what Costco's offering. They all kind of do the same thing. They try to extract the DNA of the virus. Now, the problem is which one's better? We don't know. It depends what, uh, what scientific paper you read. And the reason is the virus, sometimes it's in your nasopharynx, it's in the back of your nose. Sometimes it's in the back of your throat. Sometimes it's deep in your lungs. Sometimes it's in the saliva. And that's the problem. We don't know. Everyone could be different. But generally, these are all good tests. I wouldn't say one is better than the other. They're generally good tests. Okay, so is this Costco one something we should all run out and do? Well, I would, but the problem is it's $120. And that's great, you know, if you need a one-time test, but really what we need is testing once a week, maybe every day. We need a $5 test. You know, that's, that's gonna be the game changer. And that's yeah. what they came out with that the government has, but they need that available for everybody. That you're right, you can go to Costco or to CVS and get buy an at-home kit that's five dollars then you could test much more often i have a little symptom let me see if i'm positive the goal is to oh i am positive let me stay in let me not spread this virus another warning about that costco test and it's not costco's fault or anyone's fault they say 48 hours what if ten thousand people get it and send it in well now the lab is going to be backed up and it's going to take a lot more than 48 hours and that's what happened with quest labs you know they were touting a big turnaround time and so it can take up to seven days, 14 days we were seeing sometimes because when everyone tries to run and do it, it just takes a lot longer. Well, you were, you were instrumental, uh, Dr. Modak, in, in getting uh, the drive through collection site established here and it's over on Quincy Street. And it was so successful that Quest now is taking that over from us, which is, you know, which is still a great um, important um, asset for our community. So thanks for Mm -hmm. doing that. We, we were leaders, Virginia Hospital Center were leaders, first ones in the metropolitan region to have that. So you talked about uh, COVID um, fatigue. Uh, we have a question here. It says, I'm, uh, this person's asking, think about flying over the holidays to see family. You know, we, we already talked about mask and social distancing and things, but this person said, what other steps should this person take before, during, and after? 
Okay. What advice do you have for somebody who is made the decision to travel okay. and travel by air? So this is a, let me take it a step back and talk about risk tolerance, right? So what may be uncomfortable for me, Tony, you may say, oh, that sounds great. I'm happy to take that risk because it seems low, you know, and it, that depends on your immune system and your age and what you think could possibly happen. Are you meeting with other family? If you're, you know, you're a 30 year old person and you have a wife, and that's it, and there's no kids and no older parents, and maybe you're willing to take a little more risk because the truth is, yes, if you're 30 and you get coronavirus, there's not a high likelihood that you're gonna get super sick and die. Of course it's possible, but it's much less likely than if you're 80 years old with a kidney transplant and cancer. So you have to look at your own risk and your own risk tolerance. So let's, okay, so you're getting on a plane now. I'll tell you, I'm not gonna get on a plane for the rest of this year, maybe next summer, maybe, let's see. And my wife yells at me all the time saying, what are you talking about? Let's go fly somewhere. But for me, that's, that's my risk tolerance. And I think the plane itself is okay. I see how they do the flow and everyone wearing a mask and it looks okay. I don't like the airport. I don't like sitting in the jetway. And I know they're doing everything they can, but I can't control those tens of thousands of people around me. And people, yeah, people, they mandate masks. People wear a mask like this, right? This is not wearing a mask. This is not covering your nose. I see this all the time. I'm scared of people out there. I can control myself and that's it. So I'm not gonna take that risk, but, but generally, okay, you go on a plane, you're gonna wear a mask at all times, you have to do it. Pinch it by your nose, make sure it's tight, still stay six feet away from people. Little things you can do on the plane, don't eat anything, keep that mask on. Every time you take off your mask, that's a risk. So keep it on, you know, have your snacks beforehand. Don't, don't do it. All right, now you get to your place. I think one of the biggest risks is the people you are with. And unfortunately, we all have someone in our family or our friends who don't seem to think this is a big risk, who love to, to flaunt how they don't wear a mask and they don't need it and you're being silly. And I'll tell you, our, our employees, we, we talk about this all the time because we're healthcare workers. We think people would listen to us. But no, we're, people don't listen to us. They hate listening to us, right? Because we have something to say about everything. So... I would say know the risk of those you're with. If you really have someone who's always out, who are going, you know, in big public places and big groups or with a lot of different friends there, I mean, I'll tell you some of the people we see are sports teams and high schools and uh, cheerleading squads and they're going to this and going to that, that's a high risk. And if you can avoid those people, that would be best. And second guess your travel if someone like that will be there. What else can you do? Can you meet outside, especially if you're going, you know, in a warmer place? Can you have dinner outside? Outside is a hundred times safer than inside. Okay, you can't. It's cold outside. What about meeting outside for a few hours and then everyone retreating to their separate rooms? Yeah, it's not Thanksgiving like we know it, but it's safe. It's safer that at least you're doing some activities outside. Can everyone stay in their own floors? You know, it depends where you're going, of course. Can you be on one level and someone be on one level and someone be on the basement level and then you all meet outside, so you're still there but you meet outside. Okay, you can't do that. You, you want a traditional Thanksgiving? For the two weeks leading up to it, stay safe. Really don't go out. Don't just say, and we think we stay safe. We don't stay safe. We go to the grocery store, we have to, but don't do it. Go stock up and just stay in your house for two weeks. Do what you can. You know, driving I like because you're in your own car, you're controlling that. Go when things open or close, get takeout. Don't, don't go to restaurants. By the way, that's another thing. I, have, I don't think restaurants should be open. I'm, I don't like this indoor business. Again, you're six feet apart. Um, I tell the staff around here, we, we've come up with the MODAC rules, right? And what are the MODAC rules? So let me spell it out for everyone. It's mask, it, it spells MODAC, M-O-D-A-K. Mask, outdoors, distance, avoid crowds, and know the risks around you. But really, when I want to drill it down, it's two out of three. Masking, being outdoors, and social distancing, six feet. So if you can do two out of three, generally you're gonna be safe. But guess what? When you're eating, you're not gonna be able to wear a mask. So that's one. Okay, so you can eat outside. I don't mind going to a restaurant and sitting outside. You're gonna go sit inside a restaurant? Well, wait, now you're inside and you're not wearing a mask. That's only one out of three, that's not safe. And there's been documented transmission. It's just depending on where the event is in the restaurant, where the air conditioning unit is and how things work, that I'm sitting at this table and 10 feet away, that guy gets coronavirus. There's been plenty of data showing this. It's not safe to be in restaurants. And I don't, I, I don't want to take away business from restaurants.
but you're not, you need to not go there. If you want to stay protected, don't go to restaurants, eat outside, get takeout. That's fine. We know that transmission on objects seems less likely now. So of course, anything's possible. Uh, always wash your hands. But if you get groceries, if you get takeout food, you don't need to let it sit in your garage for a day before you start eating. It's fine. You know, you're not going to get coronavirus that way. But hopefully everyone you're with in Thanksgiving kind of agrees with you, that everyone agrees to wear a mask. Stay six feet apart. Those are things you need to do. Well, I like those MODAC rules. Uh, let's do those one more time. Can you run through those one more time? Okay, so I'll, I'll give you the brief version. It's three yeah. things. It's mask, be outdoors, social distance. You need to do two out of three to be safe. Well, we, you forgot the A and the K, so. <laughs> well, <laughs> so if you wanna go through like that, the mask, oh, yeah. mask, outdoors, distance, avoid big crowds, and know the risks of those risk. around you. I think you really need all five. I, I, I'm yeah. not trying to be a curmudgeon, but uh, yeah, three out of five is great. But I think that's a great, those are great messages. The MODAC rules, I think everybody, let's live by them and let's stay safe. So I want to thank Dr. Modak. Um, we're just about out of time for um, your um, fantastic briefing today. Uh, really gave us a, a great snapshot. Um, and um, we'll get together one more time before the end of the year. And if your schedule allows, Mr. Uh, Dr. Modak, we'll, um, we'll reach back out to you. Um, we'll be sending out the reminder when exactly it'll be, when we'll, uh, we'll host it in December. So we ask everybody on the Zoom to stay tuned for that date. Uh, it'll be coming from the Virginia Hospital Center Foundation. So, um, so that, thanks again, Dr. Modak. And to everybody out there participating, stay safe, stay healthy, and thanks for participating. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.